Hello and welcome to a very exciting co-production between World History Encyclopedia and the Study of Antiquity and the Middle Ages. Today we're going to be chatting to Ariane King all about the history of abortion and family planning in the ancient Near East and the Mediterranean. Ariane is a history writer focused on the social history of the ancient Near East and Mediterranean and we are so looking forward to hearing from her today. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, this is a topic that I'm always excited to talk about and very interested in. So, Brilliant. Well, I think we should just get right into it. Um, how far back does the concept of abortion and family planning and contraceptives go? It probably goes back to prehistory, but historians can definitively say that it goes back to at least the Bronze Age, because that's when we have the first written evidence of it as like a medical practice of it as something that you know people um do wow brilliant um and so in regards to where in the world do we have that kind of evidence is it only in sort of one area or do we see it worldwide um so f for the purposes of this video i'm mostly going to talk about um the ancient mediterranean and the near east because those are the regions that i'm most familiar with and i feel like i could answer um you know with a good a degree of confidence. Um, to my knowledge, the oldest um, written reference to abortion comes from ancient Egypt around 1500 BC. And then after that point, you see um, evidence of it in a lot of neighboring civilizations, um, Babylon, Greece, um, Assyria, and so forth. Wow, that's incredible. So we have ancient texts. What exactly do they refer to like what do they mention do they mention the actual process of it or do they just mention the the concept of it the first reference to it is in a medical text um, in the Ebers papyrus um, and it basically is instructions presumably written by a physician for other physicians on how to perform um, early term abortions you know um, and then the vast majority of our evidence for abortion comes from those medical texts when you're looking at Egypt um, when you look at other civilizations, you see it pop up in, you know, laws, in uh, poetry about day-to-day -day life. This is especially true of Greece and Rome, because you have a good amount of poetry um, written during that period that talks about people's lives, their relationships, and things like that. But for the ancient Near East, especially in the Bronze Age, you don't have a lot, or you don't have as much of that type of evidence. So it's harder to look at it from that angle, from the personal day-to-day -day life angle. Right. So we have both medical and also personal. So do we have any like names of women that actually went through an abortion? That's a, a little bit more difficult. And this kind of just speaks to a problem that you have with ancient sources in general. Um, the majority of them um, are written by men for primarily male audiences. So women's perspectives, their personal like lives and their experiences are kind of limited. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of many women um, like that. There's one example from the work of a male Roman poet, Marshall, about his um, lover who, you know, had an abortion. Um, but uh, besides that, there's not much. Right, that's so fascinating. So obviously abortion is something that in the ancient world only happened to women. However, we only have evidence that males were not only reading these texts, but writing these texts. Are there any sort of evidence with women actually engaging with any of this literature? Um, again, not really, because... It, there's just such of a huge bias in the type of evidence that we have that survives. Um, so when we get it from physicians, the vast majority of our um, evidence of writing that was authored by physicians is male physicians, such as Hippocrates. And he um, mentions uh, helping a um, courtesan, you know, to receive an abortion. He doesn't mention her name. We don't really know anything about her as a person, what her life was like, um, you know, who she was or any of that, because to him and to his presumed audience, that wasn't important. 
And when you do have in particularly Greek and Roman literature, when they do talk about um, women receiving abortions and the reason why, it's often with such a misogynistic slant. It's because, oh, they're vain or they want to hide that they're having extramarital affairs or anything. And not a lot of the times the actual reasons why, the practical reasons why, the emotional reasons, we just miss out on that. So there's no like comments on whether it's for a medical reason, like whether it's something that's actually affecting their health? Um, We do receive that. Also, again, primarily from um, physicians, you know, when they wrote about abortion. Um, Because pregnancy in the ancient world was just so dangerous, you know, it... um, before a whole bunch of recent medical advancements, even even today it's dangerous, but particularly in antiquity, there was just a, such a high rate of maternal mortality and complications um, that, you know, a lot of the times abortion could be a matter of life or death. It could be life-saving. Right. So we do have that because, I mean, I know today that's a main, you know, a lot of the times women want to get abortions because it is going to save their life, which, so it's incredible that it's, you know, that reason for it is which it shouldn't be but yes controversial um okay what about so when we've got these medical texts do they mention like any physical things that they use do we have any sort of evidence for actual medical um instruments that would have been used so we have a lot of evidence about the two main types of abortion that that women could have received in antiquity um the first was um by consuming or in some way administering different um, plants and herbs or other chemicals that were known to have abortificent qualities that were known to induce miscarriages or to terminate pregnancies. And the, f- the interesting thing with this is that most of the times when women received an abortion um, in this way, um, the person who would actually be administering it, who would be in the, phys- the physician's role or the doctor's role, would be another woman. Often these were administered by midwives or by women who had a lot of knowledge of and ex- you know, experience in dealing with medicinal plants. And that's part of why it's such a tragedy that our sources are you know, almost entirely um, written by men because we miss out on a huge portion of that knowledge and of, you know, that aspect of it. The second um, method would be surgical abortions. And these would often be administered by a male physician, by a surgeon. Um, But they were less common because surgery, um, particularly any kind of gynecological surgery, Um, was often considered to be very dangerous. Um, They didn't have, you know, any way to sterilize their tools as effectively as we do now, antibiotics, um, none of that. So it was often in and of itself a risky undertaking. And it can be hard to identify what ancient surgical tools were actually used for. A lot of the times they were probably multi-purpose because, you know, you have one set of tools and you use them for whatever you can. So when it comes to identifying actual instruments and saying definitively this must have been used for abortion, it's hard. It was probably used for a variety of surgical procedures, um, abortion being just one of them. For sure. So when it comes to the herbs and you know the medicinal plants, number one, do we know what these herbs and plants are? And also, do we know, was this effective? Did it, did it work? Um, a lot of them actually still um, uh, exist today. Some of them like um, pennyroyal and acacia. And there have actually been um, medical trials, clinical trials, to see if these plants or certain compounds from them are effective in inducing abortion. And a lot of the times, they can be very effective. Um, Some plants, like uh, sylvium, which was used um, primarily in Greece and Rome and parts of the Near East, it no longer exists. It went extinct, so we can't speak to that. But for plants that we can um, study today, a lot of them would be. But this depends on how they were administered, the dosage, and so many other factors. So depending on, you know, where you were in the ancient world, um, who you were um, going to, to, you know, um, obtain any kind of medical help from, the efficacy would vary greatly, depending on their knowledge, their expertise. And did that come, did that sort of, I'm assuming depending on your status and how much wealth you had, would that then also affect the ability? like the access to these kinds of things? Could every, anyone go and get an abortion or was it sort of 
only for the upper echelons, people that could afford one could have one? Um, that's It's kind of hard to say um, because the thing is medical care in the ancient world was so variable. There was no... There were no medical schools. There was no, like, licensing or anything like that. So technically, we do know of, you know, very, like, wealthy people who maybe went to people who were physicians or who, you know, were had a good reputation. And maybe by modern standards, they didn't do such a good job. And at the same time, it's very possible that you could have been um, in a rural area or you could have been uh, less wealthy and still had access to a local physician or a local midwife or, you know, anyone like that who, through their personal experience and their knowledge, might have been very good at what they did. Right. So in general, um, you know, if you were poor or whatever, you wouldn't then necessarily have access? It's... This is, again, something that's really hard to say, because access to um, physicians in the ancient world is so, like, patchy. It depended on where you lived. It depended on, you know, what time period you lived in. Uh, We do know that some women who, um, you know, might have been um, poorer, they might have been more rural, or they might have been um, of lower social status that did still have access to abortions and were able to receive them. So it's less so about their personal status and more so about where they are physically and what's available to them, like around them and what they can actually access in the physical sense. In the Roman Empire, um, a lot of male authors um, claimed or they believed that wealthy women were more likely to receive abortions. But this was um, a part of just broader stereotypes Um, about wealthy women or women who had more social power, that they um, maybe were more promiscuous or that they were able to do things that poor women didn't. And it's hard to say whether this is actually true or whether this is just sort of um, misogynistic stereotypes or a way of saying that abortions were frivolous or that they, you know, um, weren't necessarily always necessary or slander against specific women, especially politically powerful women. So it's hard It's hard to say. So it could also be used as, like, something against women yes, in these texts. it could be. Yeah. Higher class women. Wow. Okay. And so when we're talking about contraception, is that the same sort of thing where they would have access to that because they physically have access to it? I would say so. It's, it's, there is a lot of overlap between abortion and contraception in the ancient world because of the way that um, a lot of ancient cultures um, perceived the process of conception and the process of pregnancy. So you actually have a gray area between um, contraception and early, very early term abortion. So a lot of the same, um, you know, medicines, a lot of the same procedures, a lot of the same um, plants that could be used to terminate an early pregnancy could be used to, um, you know, induce menstruation. Um, or to prevent conception. And it's not necessarily clear that um, they made a distinction between these things. But often the person that you would go to to, you know, to purchase some type of contraception um, would be the same person who would be administering abortions. So do we know, especially considering, as you've said, that a lot of the literature that we have around contraception and abortion was written by men, do we have anything regarding the views of abortion so we know that in rome they used it potentially to go you know to slander elite women but do we have sort of the social views of abortion whether people thought that it was something that you know wasn't appropriate or whether they thought that it was something that was necessary and like a basic human right um for the most part for the societies um that we do have evidence for like you know um people's views on abortions their personal views on it it seems that it was mostly um accepted to to a great extent um like you do have the examples that i mentioned of people using it as slander in the roman empire but at the same time it was something that um many women um would have received at some point it was something that was understood to be a medical procedure that it could be life-saving that it could um, preserve um, the health of women and that just for social or economic reasons it could be very important Um, this is true not just in greece and rome but also in for example um, jewish communities in the ancient near east and the ancient mediterranean Um, You have a lot of actual religious literature from that period that um, talks about abortion. It talks about contraception and it even outlines, um, you know, situations in which, you know, to protect the health of the mother or her well-being, 
um, you should or you are morally almost obligated to perform an abortion where it can be life-saving or where it can um, benefit the mother in important ways. So in these areas, so we're talking, you know, the Near East, Mediterranean, um, was there any sort of, so since we have so much medical text, was there any sort of advancement or um, development in these concepts of abortion and contraception or did it say pretty like they had something that it worked and they didn't really try new things there was definitely some advancement um, because when you look at um, just medicine reproductive health care and health care in general in the ancient near east in egypt and um, for example babylon and assyria um, during that bronze age period um, you do have obviously you have some effective treatments but you also have um, a kind of medical theory that is based heavily on spiritual factors, on supernatural factors. So magic and medicine are very much interwoven. And you have a lot of, um, you know, treatments that, um, from a modern point of view, aren't that effective. Magical amulets, magical spells that probably did not do much, but were used in conjunction with, um, you know, um, plants and surgical procedures that would have been more useful. But if you look at um, during the Greek and Roman periods, um, well, of course, supernatural and um, religious uh, methods were still used by some physicians, by some midwives. You have a growing focus on empirical evidence and on like physical causes of both ailments and of things like, you know, um, pregnancy. So obviously the treatments that were used became a, a bit more effective, a bit more rooted in like the scientific method. But it's not, it's, it's not a clear line of progression, but you do, I think, have some development. Okay, because they, they shifted their sort of focus from the supernatural to the, the physical. So when it comes to the religion of these cultures, there wasn't any sort of, I don't know, pushback? Like there was nothing in the religion that said that there was, you know that went against the idea of abortion and contraception? For the most part, no. Um, to my knowledge, most polytheistic religions, like with, you know, multiple gods, like the Greek pantheon or Egyptian religion, um, there wasn't any particular religious objection to abortion at all. Because, um, for one thing, the concept of, like, insolment or, like, a life beginning at conception did not exist. Um, they felt... Um, in much the way that um, modern scientists and modern doctors feel that, um, you know, gestation is a gradual process. You know, from the moment of conception, it's not necessarily a person, and it may never be. And this is something that is pretty common throughout the Near East and the ancient Mediterranean. Uh, there's only one exception that I can think of, and that is in the Zoroastrian religion of Persia, which was always, um, even within the um, Persian Empire, it wasn't necessarily the prevailing religion. Um, you had within the empire a lot of other religions and beliefs and traditions that continued on in, you know, um, tandem with Zoroastrianism. And looking at um, monotheistic religions in the ancient Near East, for example, Judaism, again, there's no um, objection to abortion at that point. So we don't get any sort of dichotomy, any sort of um, clash of ideas and views until we move into when? So like the modern period, literally like the last few hundred years, or was it sort of, if you know, like medieval, when does this idea that it's a bad thing, when did that start? It can be like clearly traced to the second or third century AD, because this is when Christianity began to develop. It began to develop as the primary religion in the Roman Empire. And it wasn't a foregone conclusion that early Christians would decide that abortion was necessarily a sin or that contraception was a sin. This was something that early Christians debated um, because in the Bible, in the Old Testament, or the New Testament, and in the different um, religious texts that they had at the time, uh, it's not clearly, like, you know, uh, prohibited at all. So it was something that a lot of early Christian theologians and a lot of um, who we now refer to as church fathers, um, the people who, you know, helped to found the doctrine that modern Christian denominations often draw on. It wasn't a foregone conclusion to them. They debated it. They weren't sure. 
and it was in this um, environment of controversy and of back and forth and of religious debate on the morality of it that you started to have the first staunch anti-abortion advocates come forth. The first one that I can think of, the earliest one that's usually seen as like the progenitor of this is Tertullian. He was a, um, you know, a Roman Christian uh, living in the empire. Um, and he took the stance that um, contraception was a sin because humans, um, Christians, had a responsibility to multiply, to reproduce, and that, you know, any kind of sex that wasn't for reproductive purposes was inherently sinful, um, even within marriage. And he also took the stance that um, life began at conception. And this was not something that every other Christian uh, believed. It was not something that every other Christian, even in the centuries after him, in late antiquity, in the, the Middle Ages, agreed with. Because you have prominent theologians like Augustine of Hippo who are like, actually, um, abortion can be a good thing. It can be necessary. It's not necessarily a sin. And this is in like the 5th century. This is in like towards the early Middle Ages. But Tertullian was the first to take the hard line um, anti-abortion stance. And then after that point, um, often within the church, you do have a lot of religious objections to abortion. And I guess that is why there's such, so many hot, hotly debated, it's, it's such a hotly debated topic now. And, that's, and it, that stems from a concept from 2000 years ago. Yeah. And the interesting thing is it was a controversy then. It was a controversy during the Middle Ages. It was never something that you could point to like a Christian doctrine or like Christians as a whole and say um, every uh, Christian theologian, every, you know, uh, bishop, every priest or whatever thinks that this is a sin. It was always something that was debated. And I think that's part of why um, even today it continues to be something that's debated, because although you have, you know, hardliners who are like, well, this interpretation obviously is the correct one. Um, anything else is wrong. It's not something that's explicitly stated in the religious text. So it's something that's always open to interpretation. The objection to abortion is something that's almost a matter of tradition. It's almost assumed because it's something that so many prominent um, leaders in the church have um, advocated for it and have stated as truth for so long. It's fascinating that it would just be accepted by numerous different cultures with different religions and different beliefs. And then suddenly this one guy is like, hold on. And then that causes 2000 years of, of debate. Yeah. And sometimes that's just the way that um, societal or cultural changes can happen because um, the the spread of Christianity and then the um, use of even today, even in you know secular cultures in many parts of Europe and uh, even the Middle East and Africa, Christianity is almost built into the ethical and the legal framework of these countries because it was the um, prevailing religion for so long. But to understand part of, of where the I guess, um, shift or the sea change in viewing abortion as something that's negative as opposed to being more accepting of it comes from is broader changes in how people thought of women and of women's um, bodies and their autonomy over their bodies that happened at the same time that Christianity was um, beginning to spread and was beginning to become a more cohesive church, like as an entity that was um, in some ways almost like a, a nation state in itself. So at the same time, you have a lot of the same individuals like Tertullian who are advocating for women to... Um, basically be more controlled in their personal lives. Um, so while technically early Christians didn't want anyone to have, you know, premarital sex or to have these relationships, it was especially stated that women should not. Like, it's especially unforgiven, unforgivable when it's a woman. And that a woman's place is specifically to have children, to nurture children, um, and all of that. Whereas with men, they had a bit more leeway. So it makes sense then that abortion and contraception would be first on the chopping block of things that you're thinking, well, you know what, actually, this is not something that you should have access to. This is something that we should look at banning. Because I guess historically, women, I mean, especially I'm thinking of Greece and Rome, you know, they're sort of 
there is that, um, especially for women that are married. Um, so, you know, there's the idea that they should, their, their place in the society is the domestic setting. So there is that sort of um, control over maybe their movements, but I wouldn't, like, I don't recall ever sort of reading about men having control over their bodies. You know, you, you have that idea that the men work outside and then they're the ones that are vocal in politics and society, but then women have their own domain in the home. And although today we're like, oh, no, thank you. I would like to go out and, and, and you know, be a part of politics and et cetera, et cetera. You don't feel that there's that, like that control over them as a person. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, and especially, this is especially true of ancient Greece. Um, men and women almost lived in separate um, spheres because, like you said, women occupied very much that private sphere of life, you know, in the home, um, whereas men very much were present and active in the public sphere, you know, in politics, in uh, business and things like that. So um, you do, to an extent, have women who live very vibrant, very, you know, complex lives in that sphere. And another thing is, um, like you mentioned, women's bodily autonomy, women did lack rights in ancient Greece and Rome. They had higher degree of bodily autonomy in some ways, because when it came to um, their bodies, their pregnant bodies, their um, control over their own health, they basically, as far as we know, had final say. This was not something that, um, for the most part, um, men like could intrude on in some cases this was limited to an extent for example in some cases in some parts of greece during like specific time periods um women did have to obtain like the permission of their husband if they wanted an abortion but this seems to be almost possibly the exception rather than the rule and it's still an improvement from later periods when the um shift um, turn to women not being able to use contraception or to obtain an abortion at all. Yeah, when they essentially became property <laughs> of, of the, their male garden. I guess we sort of have that idea in the ancient world as well, but less so bodily autonomy wise. And I guess when it comes to especially ancient Egypt, women could be physicians. Women could be scribes, learn to read, and then become medical practitioners. And so we can only assume then that that sort of bodily autonomy extends to that region. And I can only assume it'd be this kind of same thing in Mesopotamia as well and in the ancient Near East where they had the ability, I think, to be medical practitioners. Um, physicians, yeah. Yeah, to some extent. Um, it, it definitely, I would say, Egypt is an obvious um, candidate for a society where women had a lot of rights. They could, you know, own and operate businesses. They could own property. They were, like you said, they could be educated as physicians or scribes. And then even when you look at other societies in the Near East, in Mesopotamia, they're a little bit less egalitarian. There's a little bit less gender equality, but there's still a good amount of freedom for women in those societies. And again, you do have um, in going off of information in, you know, Mesopotamian literature and evidence and in evidence from um, civilizations like Persia, we do know that women um, worked in this, you know, medical field to some extent, that most, you know, midwives were women, that women often went to other women when they wanted to um, obtain some kind of medical treatment. So that was their first option. And that makes it kind of a abortion and contraception and just women's reproductive health in general was kind of a woman's sphere. It was something that was, you know, primarily between women. Well, I think we've pretty much covered the whole of abortion and contraception in the uh, ancient Near East and in the Mediterranean. So thank you so much for joining me. It has been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Absolutely. It was wonderful talking to you about this as well.